Hi, uh, welcome to this week's Soccer 101 lecture. Um, this week I'll be talking um, about um, digital sociology, where I'll be taking you through um, some sociological ways of thinking about the internet, uh, information communication technology, you know, digital technologies, what we kind of broadly call information communication technology, ICTs, and we're thinking about ways to sociologically analyse those things. Um, up until the week on media, uh, we pretty much taught um, the course content, you know, I suppose IRL in real life, talking about relationships between peoples and institutions and, and stuff like that. And we, I suppose we drew upon some kind of media and digital um, examples here and there. Um, but here I want to kind of talk about um, the ways that the technologies that, that I've just kind of outlined have changed the way that we live in many ways opened up all kinds of opportunities and ways of communicating and new forms of entertainment, but also at the same time um, formulated new forms of risks and in many ways entrenched, you know, old inequalities. So as you'll kind of see as I move through this week's content, um, there's, a, there's an ambivalence in sociology around what um, these new technologies have done to our lives. Um, you know, some will say that it made them better, more happy, more efficient. Others say that they've kind of, you know, made us more anxious or, you know, more, less equal, um, you know, uh, exposed to more risks. So there's a kind of balance between those things um, in sociological, in sociology in general, and I'll be kind of presenting an array of those ways of thinking about the digital world today. I'm breaking it up into four parts. So in the first part, I'll just go over some kind of broad, I suppose, understandings of what I'm talking about. So one of the key th um, things to think about here is just what digital technologies are. I mean, for the most part, we can think about the advancement of technology beyond one-way technology. And by that, I mean things like, you know, uh, radio and television, things that kind of transmit information towards us. And certainly the first kind of what we can maybe call version of the internet was kind of like that as well in a way, even though you could talk to each other. Um, but today there's much more kind of two-way or multiplicity of kind of connections happening in these things that aren't always just between people or between people and their computer and other people's computer, but a whole bunch of different platforms, different ways of tracking, things like cookies and all that kind of stuff now um, become part of this, you know, broad network assemblage that we're all living in. This has done a few things in terms that we relate to each other and the way, we, the way we relate to institutions, particularly around that distinction between what's public and what's private. Not just in terms of who owns what, but also the very definition of things like privacy have been you know, increasingly stretched and debated as um, you know, we're tracked and we give up our information more and more. So digital technologies in general are used to produce information and entertainment they transmit it, they also track it and store the data and, you know, reuse that kind of stuff to, you know, make profit and to um, give us um, information about what we like and try and sell stuff back. So they're computerised technologies, they use things like codes, you know, systems of data and coding, storage and transmission. The technical aspects in particular, there's not a great deal of sociologists that know a lot about that, but there's an increasing amount that do. So it's actually an interesting interdisciplinary thing that's happening more and more that computer scientists and sociologists are working together, or that sociologists are increasingly getting computer science training to have a kind of um, specific understanding of those how the, those technologies work. One of the most influential, influential um, sociologists when thinking about this, um, the, the way that digital and information and communication technologies have changed the world is uh, that of Man Manuel Castells, who's, you know, huge three-pronged um, uh, study in the 90s called the Information Age and the Network Society. has um, been very in influential on the way that sociologists think about this stuff, the way that uh, communication scholars as well. Um, I think he's probably the most cited um, sociologist in communication studies. Castells basically argued that these new technologies would, in some ways, create a new means of production, that we would move out of what you know was traditionally a, a capitalist system about producing things to a, to a system that maybe still capitalism, might not be, 
but a new system that would be largely, largely about the kind of production and dissemination and ownership of information. Where the key thing that was made in capitalism, in, you know, traditionally would have been making products, whether that's, you know, shoes, tables, cars, whatever. Castells argued in the 90s that information would become the key thing to think about when thinking about production and consumption um, in what he called the information age in the network society. And in many ways, those predictions and that analysis has played out. So you can see that he was quite accurate um, in terms of seeing what that was going on. That's not to say the production of things isn't still hugely important, but even the production of stuff now has a kind of whole infrastructure of digital communication technology over the top of it that kind of, you know, tracks where things are, you know, tracks the workers, um, takes uh, our data to kind of find what we like or whatever to try and sell us that data, that sell us those products. In particular, I think an interesting thing that he thought of here was a kind of new relation between what we've been calling in the core structure and agency, what he called the net and the self. And this new relationship would mean that identity formations would change. And he saw three very, very broad ways of thinking about this. Castells argued there'd be legitimizing identities, which are essentially that kind of stuff that we would have seen throughout the course so far, you know, like Frank School or Marx people that were largely reproducing, you know, ideology, you know, for the, the, the capitalist system, I suppose. There's resistance identity. Now, this was a kind of, um, kind of slight twisting on resistance rather than resisting, you know, to capitalism per se and trying to kind of, you know, have a Marxist revolution. What um, Castells argued would happen with resistance identities is that they would largely be what reactionary. They would look to the past and try and you know recreate aspects of the past because they would feel more safe by doing that. The reason for this, Castell argued, is that the new relationship with the net and self would actually um, fundamentally change the way people are in the world and the way that they feel about the world, depending on their class position. Those doing well out of it are more likely to look towards legitimising identities, but those that feel left behind, those that um, you know have see their jobs, you know disappear and say like BHP in the 1990s and disappears out of Australia and moves off to Southeast Asia where production starts happening, the people that are made redundant there would feel that, you know, this new stuff that's going on is a threat to their well-being and their, their livelihoods and would look for, to the past for kind of ways of being and for different forms of politics to kind of um, alleviate these, these problems in their lives. And again, I think there's you know, aspects of what Castells was talking about has played out here, and you can see all around the world the rise of right movements, things like One Nation in Australia, um, the alt right, you know, Brexit and stuff like that, seem to kind of be trying to, in some ways, put globalisation genie back in the bottle. The third one would be what um, Castells called project identity, and these were um, kind of political identities that were trying to change the system as a whole. Um, in particular, Castells pointed out the environmental movement and feminism as being versions of that. Another thing that uh, Castells was particularly savvy in predicting would be the way the corporations would change. The large-scale bureaucracies would be less efficient because corporations would have to move fast in a in kind of more flexible, um, connected world, and they would move to what he called network enterprises. Now, that's not to say that kind of bureaucratic structures aren't still really important. But, um, you know, co companies have to be more flexible and embrace these kind of ways of being, you know, that um, increasingly used neoliberal kind of buzzword of being agile. For Castells also, this would fundamentally change the way that we experience time and space. Um, time, what he called timeless time, the idea that the way these technologies basically create a 24-7 economy, you know, you can be laying on your back in bed and, you know, buy a book or, or whatever in, from your, um, through your phone at night. So this allows kind of, you know, things like consumption to happen all the time, things like communication to happen all the time. Uh, but it also means that, you know, things like economic markets don't really ever close. And this kind of speeds up the way that those things um, practice. For Castells, this means that much of this action happens in what he called the space of flows, which is both um, a geographical way of thinking about where things are, but also the way that the internet itself is like a network that kind of is a layer on top of geographical space. And importantly, that, um, you know, global cities like New York and Tokyo and London and places like that would be key nodes of space of flows.
but there would also be the kind of you know various platforms um, that are um, part of you know the internet itself that kind of disseminates and controls information as well. Cassell's argued that all this would mean that politics in particular would become about communication power, um, producing what he called networks of outrage and networks of hope. And again, you can I think um, those kind of broad conceptual um, understandings of um, politics online and politics in general, I think, have um, kind of played out in many of the ways that Castell's predicted. So in terms of that development, you know, we can think of a development of how, say, the internet has changed over time. Certainly when it began, it was kind of more one-way websites, you know, users create their own cons content, you know, physical cables connecting things, you know, giant cumbersome desktops. desktops. Um, chat rooms were kind of a way to people to talk to each other, often it was fairly anonymous. Um, and really around this time in the 80s and the 90s, there was this kind of almost romanticised idea of what the internet would produce, the kind of idea that people could be freed from their own, you know, bodily identities and kind of perform versions of themselves online that um, can free them from, say, you know, marginalisation and things like that. As the web developed, it kind of web 2.0, Kind of more two-way stuff we have wi-fi we have kind of social networking start to develop mobile devices in particular change the way that we consume the internet that is that we can kind of do it from anywhere rather than sitting in the one spot through now where we kind of is moving towards what's being called web 3.0 where we have smart objects that communicate with each other that don't need a human to be you know um, using them for them to continue to uh, communicate um, and always, the, and many, many more devices, I suppose, are now tr um, connected to the web. So even something like the internet itself has seen already, um, you know, over the past 30 years to have these different versions of it. Um, who knows what will happen in um, Web 4.0. So in terms of you know, these developments, you know, the idea, there's, a, there's, a, there's certainly an ambivalence, I suppose, of what this means for you know, humans and their kind of places within these networks. There was a certain romance at first about how, you know, people could like disappear in a way, they could perform versions of themselves outside of those constraints. Um, they could, you know, communicate with people all around the world and, you know, make all these kind of joyous, entertaining, you know, emotional connections. So that's kind of, you know, a, a very kind of a good affordance that the internet creates. But in terms of being able to kind of, you know, disappear in that sense, become someone else, or become anonymous. Um, it's not so much as the web's uh, developed, because particularly in what we would call the web 3.0, these technologies increasingly track us 24-7. Um, they know where we are, we know who we're talking to, they know what we're buying, they even know, you know when we're sleeping and all that kind of stuff now. So again, there's a kind of ambivalence here, there's still many opportunities on the web to be anonymous. Sometimes that's you know for good, sometimes not so much. Um, but certainly these things track us more and more, and we'll talk about aspects of that further into the lecture. So this is kind of what I mean here with ambivalence. There's both affordances provided by the internet and digital technologies in general, but there's also increased risks, and the playoff between those things are kind of, I suppose, the constant things that are debated in, in public discourse. Um, there's lots of moral panics around this stuff all the time. Um, and there's also, like, you know, increasingly, I suppose, uh, criticism of things like Facebook and, and stuff like that in terms of their influence on our lives and influence on elections and, and stuff like that. So sociologists are interested in studying these relationships, these networks, what sometimes called digital landscapes, and the way that they mediate social relationships. In many ways, they mediate, you know, very traditional old forms of social relationships between families and friends, they also mediate traditional inequalities through, you know, notions of class and gender, sexuality, race, religion, all these kind of things. These contours of inequality are still kind of carried by the web. Um, but they also provide us with all kinds of other possibilities to talk to people that we probably wouldn't talk to if we can only talk in real life. What's interesting here, I suppose, is again that kind of playoff between the possibility of progressive um, forms of social transformation of people understanding other cultures more and more because they have an opportunity to read about them or know people, um, even if it's only through digital um, technologies. 
or whether these technologies are kind of, in, in fact, creating you know false information, um, increasing discrimination, putting people in what's called filter bubbles that I'll again talk about later on. So there's good and bad, there's affordances and risks happening with these kind of the potentiality of what um, the internet does. And you'll see that, um, you know, if you look into the sociology of this stuff, there's tends to be like the theory, many of the theories we've pointed out throughout the class, throughout the classes so far, you know, more, those more interested in kind of a Marxist critical theory will tend to have more negative things to say. Um, and others, will, you know, have more positive things to say about the way that identity can be like transgressed or, um, or, or presented and performed. So, yeah, um, there's certainly also an interest, I think, in a way, not just the way that humans um, connect in these networks, but the way that we start almost directly connecting with and being part of this technology as well. And this often is um, related to what's called post-human. Um, the, the way that, um, firstly, these technologies are often communicating with each other, with each other without much human inter intervention. So there's, you know, a growing interest in, you know, that kind of scientific dystopia of the future of, you know, as machines become more and more intelligent, will they actually think humans are required anymore to exist? Um, and if you're interested in looking into kind of the thought experiments around that, look at the debates around um, Rocco's Basilisk, uh, which is, um, I won't go into too much detail, but the thought experiment that... Um, as these machines get smarter, they'll, they'll see that we already know that we're worried about whether they're going to kill us or not in the future, and they'll um, probably kill us um, anyway just to be safe because of the fact that we might shut them down. I'm massively oversimplifying that, but um, it's something uh, worth checking out if you're interested in those kind of thought experiments. Increasingly, too, we see the Internet of Things, increasingly stuff like fridges, and stuff like that are connected to the web, all these kind of things that kind of can track our data, um, and which, which means that, you know, humans themselves come caught up in this network. They're just part of the network. They don't necessarily dominate it. One way of thinking about this is through Donna Haraway's ideas of the way that humans are increasingly becoming cyborgs. And again, you can think of the kind of, you know, Terminator version of the cyborg there. And, but Haraway's kind of, um, metaphorical use of the idea of cyborg isn't necessarily that kind of dystopian um, apocalyptic version of it. It's a much more kind of simple everyday understanding of what cyborg means. From this point of view, people have been cyborgs ever since they invented technology. You know? So the argument here is as humans enhance their bodies more and more by the use of technology, even the simple thing of wearing glasses to be able to see better, you're using technology there to improve the human experience. And this kind of therefore means that we're you know, existing in kind of cyborgs because the technology becomes part of us. Again, you can think back here to things like pacemakers and, you know, even wearing shoes. You can think about these how these technologies attach themselves to the body and then either improve or change human behaviour. What Haraway was interested in is how these technologies could actually offer people that are often uh, marginalised ways of transgressing norms, um, in particular when it comes to gender and sexuality, um, the use of makeup and sex change uh, operations and all this kind of thing, for Haraway's point of view, could actually mean that people could be freed um, from these kind of restrictions and, and discriminations. But on the other side of that, you know, in terms of the ambivalence that I'm talking about, this kind of increase of the kind of cyborgian human um, can lead to other kind of things like obsessions, health issues around, you know, dietary and nutrition um, extremes um, and all that kind of stuff around, you know, body image where people are kind of constantly trying to find ways to improve themselves, which may not necessarily be healthy. Healthy. The other question is, is as we're kind of increasingly attached to our phones that offer all kinds of positive affordances, we can, you know, search for information instantly and find out whenever we want. We can talk to people all the time. These are good things, but also it seems to lead to other things such as, you know, being digitally tracked all the time, you know, um, leads to things like people maybe being, you know, obsessed by gaming or, um, you know, addicted to shopping or addicted to online gaming. Um, and the affordance there is that they can then do that 24-7 rather than just being able to kind of go to those places to do it at certain times. So again, again, the idea of cyborg here, there's pluses and minuses, affordances and risks. 
Um, and this is a kind of a good, I think, metaphorical way to think about that relationship between humans and technology. If you're interested in that, you can have a look at the um, documentary that's a link to there about around the cyborg experiment. So in relation to this, we can think about the way that these digital technologies can either enhance our health or maybe threaten our health. Um, Deborah Lupton is a really prominent Australian sociologist that's done a lot of research in this area, and she's um, coined the term the quantified self. It's increasingly, humans are quantified. We track and count everything through our phone, whether that's, you know, trying to make sure that we get 10,000 steps a day or people counting calories or, you know, even you know, using Google rather than going to the doctor. Um, and so uh, if you're interested in this, I think um, Deborah Lupton's work's really um, well worth checking out, and she's got a very active blog that the link is there, which is very much um, updating all the time and talking about stuff that's going on, you know, this week uh, through this, through her analysis. Um, so in this way, so again, we can think about the kind of pluses and minuses of what these technologies can do for us in terms of health. Um, they can provide us with information, they can provide us with ways to kind of improve our health, but others would argue that this, therefore, can create other problems of, um, you know, being too obsessed with your health, um, creating anxiety around these things, which doesn't necessarily lead to happiness. An example here is around pregnancy apps. Um, obviously, you know, the relationship between parents and children is a fraught one in the sense that they obviously want their young baby to be healthy and to, uh, to live well and all that kind of stuff. Certainly technologies allow um, parents to um, be able to track this stuff and increasingly from, you know, the very moment babies are born and even before then, um, they're having, you know, forms of technology attached to them. There's those, you know, things that um, parents attach to the kids of their, uh, to the feet of their kids now to kind of constantly track their, um, their heartbeat and their temperature and all that kind of stuff when they're sleeping. And you can do this from another room. Um, of course, this is a great way of being able to ensure that your baby is safe. But what it also seems to do is lead to a whole bunch of like extra anxieties and stresses around the parenting process. And so you can see how these things, as I was talking before, there's always been, you know, moral and value and ethical debates about what's a good way to be a parent. Um, technology can certainly provide us with the means to, you know, do um, parenting in different ways. Um, and then there's kind of value debates and, you know, epidemiology debates about how useful these things are. Okay, I'll leave that there and I'll um, start, um, I'll see you again in part two.